Washington. It's real talk. Maine is real talk with your main chip Washington. When it comes to information, the main got an arsenal. Bring you up to speed with what you need. He's a local and nationwide news feed. Let's talk about it. Dialect to do something about it. Chip got the flow wide open if you got questions about it. Maine, it's the show that brings you to your raw. To solve all problems, it starts with real talk. It's real talk. And here we go, here we go. On this Monday evening, it is the 11th day of September 2023, and it is 6 o'clock straight up, which means uh, you are in the midst of Real Talk Memphis. Uh, very happy to have you. Uh, very happy to be here this evening. I am your humble host. My name is Chip Washington. Uh, and uh, after a very pleasant weekend, we started the week off very pleasantly today. Temperatures this week will be in the upper 70s to low to mid 80s. And I mean, this is there. I think we're starting to see the break now uh, from summer into fall. Now, I could be setting us up uh, for some disappointment, but I don't think so. I hadn't seen a 90 degree temperature uh, in the forecast uh, for the next uh, seven to 10 days. So I'll take it. I'm sure you will uh, as well. So uh, once again, welcome in. I'm very happy to have you. We have a pretty good show for you tonight, or at least we hope you will think so. Uh, now, uh, before we get started, of course, uh, there are several ways you can get this fine piece of radio broadcasting. We are live right now on 91.7 locally on your FM dial, WYXR. You can also catch us on the WYXR app. We are on the TuneIn app live as well. And, of course, uh, we are on Facebook Live this evening, as we generally are. Uh, and if you want to check us out there, you are more than welcome to do so. Uh, and uh, when the show posts tomorrow, you will be able to catch us uh, on uh, YouTube when it posts. And uh, as we are a podcast, you can catch us wherever uh, it is you get your podcast. So uh, I think we're all fired up, set and ready to go here. I'm trying to find us on, on Facebook Live, and I haven't been able to do that just yet. There we are. There we are. Okay. I always do this, and I always keep the volume up, and I never forget. I always forget. Anyway. So you're good, right? You know where to find us. You know where we are, wherever you are, coast to coast in this country. Glad you're with us. Um, we have a good show tonight. We are going to be speaking in just a few minutes to the Shelby County DA. His name is Steve Mulroy. Uh, a lot going on. They had a crime summit recently behind closed doors. Uh, uh, he is uh, creating some new initiatives. He just finished his first year as the Shelby County DA, so we'll get his thoughts about that and uh, some of the other uh, issues and items uh, as we continue to move forward. We're going to be speaking with Catherine Burgess uh, in uh, a little bit. She is the government of reporter for uh, the Commercial Appeal. Uh, and um, there is a uh, another big mayoral uh, debate or, or whatever forum or whatever the term is you want to use for it uh, coming up this Thursday, sponsored by... Uh, WMC TV5, the Commercial Appeal, and the League of Women Voters. So she's going to be one of the moderators. So we'll uh, get her take on uh, what is happening uh, uh, in terms of the mayor's race and the city council and uh, a few more things. And a bit later on, uh, we're going to talk uh, with uh, C.J. Thomas. C.J. Uh, is the Director of Community Relations for Playhouse on the Square. And we've not had anybody on from Playhouse on the Square recently. And uh, he's a good guy. He's going to share with us uh, what the agenda is for this year. A lot of big shows that are happening this year. And uh, more of an effort to be more diverse in terms of the entertainment that Playhouse on the Square uh, provides uh, for us. Uh, so we're looking forward to talking with CJ about that uh, and getting uh, sort of an insight into some of the big shows uh, that are going to be happening this season. 
Okay, so uh, those of you who are regular attendees of this show, uh, you know right about this time we take time to celebrate you uh, and, of course, your trip around the sun. You know, these trips around the sun are coming faster and faster and faster for all of us. Uh, and, of course, if you celebrate it over the weekend or today or this week, uh, this is your time the broadcast when we uh, hit you up and uh, we shout you out all over the country. Uh, so without further ado, we will do that. But we can't do it until I say, hit it, Brent. Happy, <laughs> happy birthday, happy birthday. Lola is, uh, is uh, easing her way up to the microphone. Uh, happy birthday going out to Jacob Ransom. Happy birthday, James Park, celebrating today. Teresa Jordan, it's your birthday. Willie Peggies, it's your birthday today. Happy birthday, Savannah Jones, celebrating on this day, as is Taronda Ellis. Kevin Williams, celebrating today. And Crystal Courtney. And Lola, who you got? Happy birthday to Marcus the Granberry. And a special, special happy birthday to Miss Paige Cage on Friday. Happy birthday. Love you much. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. You know, as always, now we're all now we're complete now. Lola has done her birthday shout-outs as well. And so from all of us here at uh, Real Talk Memphis, uh, we wish you a very happy birthday. Uh, and uh, we hope uh, that it, your day has been filled with love and laughter. And uh, we're all lucky we'll be here next year to celebrate your next trip around the sun. Thank you, Brian. Now, maybe it's me or maybe you guys decided not to tune us in tonight, but I see nobody on the Facebook Live line. I hope that, that it is working properly because I see myself. Uh, but we'll see what happens uh, during the show. Uh, okay, so we get into some, uh, some news and notes here. And, of course, today uh, being September 11th, uh, it's a very somber anniversary for us as a nation. Uh, 22 years ago, of course, uh, we know what happened September 11th, uh, 2001. Uh, when planes uh, with terrorists came through, struck the uh, World Trade Center, both towers collapsed. Uh, of course, uh, they uh, struck the, uh, the Pentagon as well, uh, and uh, in Shanksville, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, we lost over 3,000 lives uh, during that uh, uh, a very terrible episode in our nation's history. And so today we mark uh, the 22nd anniversary of 9-11, uh, and uh, we hope that we will never, ever, ever see anything like that uh, as time continues to move forward. So, again, uh, this is uh, one of those days uh, in history that will always go down in history for us as a nation. So, uh, in terms of uh, other news and notes today, uh, let, me, let me say uh, that uh, the uh, Memphis River Parks, the folks who are overseeing the uh, Tom Lee Park, uh, the ones who just opened last weekend, they opened Tom Lee, brand new Tom Lee Park, beautiful in the whole nine yards. Well, uh, they have uh, had kind of an ongoing issue with uh, the Memphis in May organization. Uh, there was a $1.4 million in damages, according to the River Parks folks, uh, after the completion of Memphis in May. Well, uh, only half of that has been paid. And now Memphis River Parks is tired of waiting. They have filed a lawsuit against Memphis in May uh, for the uh, grand total of $675,000 uh, in unpaid damages. Now, it's at this point of the conversation where I will tell you that uh, based on nothing but my opinion, uh, I would have to say that I think uh, the chances of Memphis in May being back in Tom Lee Park next year are slim and none. Uh, and leaning more toward none uh, because, uh, you know, you, you think about the amount of money. Now you start to see some animosity. You're seeing lawsuits being filed uh, in terms of all of this. Uh, it, so you can't help but think that uh, Memphis and May has already told the barbecue folks that they're going to probably be moving uh, them to another location. <clears throat> I, I honestly believe that at some point in time, Memphis and May is going to shift. The question is, uh, if they decide to make that move, where are they going to go? And the only place I can think of, top of my head, is Shelby Farms. But we'll see what happens. I, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Uh, let's see here. 
COVID numbers are on the rise, ladies and gentlemen. I know you don't want to hear that. I know nobody wants to talk about COVID, uh, but it has never really gone away. It has just sort of uh, kind of meandered uh, in different variant forms. And uh, we are starting to see numbers across the country starting to eke up a bit. Now, we're not at the stage anywhere near close to the stage where we were, but it pays for you to have the knowledge and information to know uh, that uh, Memphis, uh, that uh, Memphis and Shelby County are starting to see an increase in cases, uh, and uh, there is a new uh, there is a new vaccine uh, that is uh, being created right now. It's uh, step one has been approved. Uh, the uh, CDC uh, has approved it, and the FDA is going to approve it probably in the next couple of days or so, and it will probably be available uh, at your pharmacist and other places, at your doctor's offices. Uh, sometime next week. So again, I know that that little note about COVID goes in one ear and out the other, or maybe hits the side of your head, goes up over your head and out, uh, because like I said, a lot of folks don't want to hear about it. But think about it. Uh, no mask in schools. Kids always getting sick. Uh, we're getting into the flu season as well in another few weeks. Uh, so all of these things combined uh, could uh, cause a bit of a problem. And when we start talking about school districts shutting down because children, faculty, and staff are sick, then maybe we will realize that uh, there is an actual problem that we are dealing with out here in terms of COVID. So this weekend was uh, Southern Heritage Classic weekend. And boy, there was a lot of stuff going on all over the city and county this weekend. And I mean, I mean, people everywhere out, beautiful weather. And uh, this, of course, was the first Southern Heritage Classic uh, since Jackson State University pulled out last year. And uh, but let me just tell you something. I was out there uh, on Saturday and it, it was just, like it always is a very beautiful event. Congratulations to the University of uh, Arkansas Pine Bluff for showing up. And they showed out. They really they did a wonderful job coming in. This is their first opportunity to be here. There was a lot of that black and gold all over the uh, all over the place, uh, and again another successful, peaceful event uh, steered by Mr. Fred Jones. Congratulations, Fred! Uh, this was year number thirty-four, uh, and it was a pretty good football game too. Uh, as a matter of fact, Tennessee State came out on top uh, of that. Let's see here. What else do I have to talk a little bit about? Oh yeah, uh, I sort of skipped this uh, story, but many of you heard about the concert at the FedEx Forum last week with Little Baby. Uh, well, there apparently someone snuck a gun in uh, to the concert inside the FedEx Forum, and an individual was shot uh, at that concert. Of course, uh, the concert was immediately uh, stopped at that particular point in time. So now the question is, how did the gun get inside FedEx Forum? And we all know uh, that if you've ever gone to an event, uh, you, you, you know what they do. They wand you, right? You go through metal detectors, the whole nine yards. They try to check as, as, as well as they can. Uh, so uh, that's not it, obviously. So that only leaves, again, this is, this is the chip thing. Uh, as I was thinking about, okay, well, how, how would someone get a gun, smuggle a gun in, in there? Everybody's talking about this was premeditated uh, and was kind of an inside deal. So you know the vendors, you know the folks that sell you the refreshments and the food and, and all of that, you know, they, they, they come in, they come and go pretty regularly because they have to, right? They're, you know, I mean, they're feeding folks. They need to go get supplies. They need to go replenish supplies. So maybe somebody who worked uh, on the culinary staff, maybe somebody who worked with one of these food vendors, uh, you know, knew somebody who knew somebody who got a gun in, and the individual who was shot is in critical condition. Uh, but, yes, uh, that is a part of an ongoing and active investigation. We will keep you posted. All right, so I'm going to take my first break of the hour. And when we come back, we're going to kick things off. What do you say uh, on this Monday evening? We are going to talk with our Shelby County District Attorney. His name is Steve Mulroy. My name is Chip Washington. You know who you are. First break of the night. We'll be right back. If you like Real Talk, here's a way you can get involved. Do you have a show topic idea or suggestion? Want to be considered a guest or have a guest idea? Then send Chip a message on his Real Talk show page and you can be a part of the Real Talk experience. So as he always says, go out and tell somebody. We'll be right back. It's Real Talk. 
Goner Records is proud to sponsor WYXR. The 20th Goner Fest is coming to Rail Garden Thursday, September 28th through Sunday, October 1st, featuring bands from all over the globe, including the OCs, the Gories, the Mummies, Coffin, Sweeping Promises, Marked Men, and over 20 more bands and DJs. Ticket and streaming information at GonerFest.com. Fall is the season of homecomings. This Saturday, September 16th at 10 a.m., Grammy Award-winning singer-songwriter Jason Isbell is returning to Memphis, and he's stopping by the WYXR studio for a solo acoustic performance and an exclusive interview with me, your host, Liv Cohen. Listen live on 91.7 FM or WYXR.org. Want to experience it in person? We've got room for you to hang out and watch in the central atrium of Crosstown Concourse. Mark those calendars. You don't want to miss it. At WYXR, we are committed to uplifting local organizations and businesses who are making an impact in Memphis. If you are looking for ways to spread the word about your business on air and want to support WYXR at the same time, email us at sponsorships at WYXR.org. Get Real Talk on the TuneIn mobile app under WYXR, and he's now streaming live on Facebook. And you can also catch a rebroadcast on YouTube. Just put WYXR in the search box and hit subscribe. Now back to more Real Talk with Chip Washington. And welcome back to Real Talk Memphis on this. A beautiful Monday evening in the city. Chip with you. Uh, and as I said uh, earlier, uh, we are very uh, pleased to have uh, back on the show our Shelby County District Attorney. Uh, he is Steve Mulroy. Uh, and uh, General, it is great to see you. Uh, thanks for coming on. Oh, it's always a pleasure. So, Although, you know, I'm not really too fond of the term general. Okay. Well, what should I call you? <laughs> a lot of people call me D.A. Mulroy or D.A. Okay. I, I can do that. You know, I, I just, you know, you, you, you try to respect the position and you know, how I'm just, I'm always yeah. trying to be respectful. So, uh, well, well, um, well, first of all, uh, congratulations on uh, your, your first year. You just finished your first year in office. And uh, I, uh, to say it has been uh, uneventful and busy would be the biggest understatement I could ever possibly make. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Having said all that, uh, in just in, as as uh, as an overview, uh, how would you say uh, things have gone for you in this in this first year period? Well, I think uh, Chip, uh, so far so good. I think it's been more good than bad. I mean, obviously we've had a lot of challenges. Uh, crime had been steadily rising for the last decade, particularly violent crime, and uh, that continued. So, you know, we definitely have a crime crisis. We need an all hands on deck approach. And that's why I did my crime summit uh, a week ago. Um, you know, we, I think we're, we're, we're you know, getting us our arms around what our priorities should be to deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you know, we've handled the fastballs as they've come in. You know, my first week was the Eliza Fletcher case right. followed right. shortly by the Ezekiel Kelly murder spree. Um, we had a record number of officer-involved shootings in uh, December of my year, and then start the new year, we had Tyree Nichols. Yeah, yeah. You know, so there's been a lot of uh, challenges, but um, I've been blessed with a really great and competent and hardworking and supportive staff, and I, I think we've met them with flying colors. So, uh, you know, you mentioned it, and I was going to mention it as well. You did have a crime summit. It was a closed-door meeting with you and— uh, all of the top level uh, officials uh, here in the city uh, and the county. And of course, uh, you know, the press, none of us knew about it until after it was over. So what was what was the purpose uh, uh, of that? It, it seems as if uh, you, you guys got down to the nitty gritty, perhaps, uh, in terms of communicating with one another. But but what was your goal in terms of putting all that uh, all of that together? Well, <clears throat> I thought it was useful uh, since there really was a. Uh, both the perception and reality of a, of a crisis uh, among the public, <clears throat> that we get all the key decision makers in that area together in one room where we can speak freely and candidly. We can share data, share ideas, share perspectives, and try to agree on three to five 
consensus priorities mm -hmm. that we could implement and maybe begin to see at least some preliminary results for in the midterm, say six to 18 months. And that's exactly what we did. We came up with some priorities that I think we're, we have a strong consensus on that we're gonna be focusing on. It was also useful, Chip, for the public to see us all convening together and devoting an entire day to hashing out a consensus strategy, um, because I think it's useful for the public to be reassured that, yes, we do get it. It is a problem. We are taking it seriously, and we are trying to work together and be on one page and get away from all the finger pointing and blame gaming that's been going on a lot lately. One of the things that uh, you talked about even before you were elected uh, is the transparency. And we're starting to see uh, a, a lot of that coming from your office. Now, you're having weekly press conferences uh, to talk about uh, some of the initiatives and other things that are happening here. And one, and one of the other things you just announced uh, was that uh, in terms of... Uh, of uh, crimes uh, or, or, or incidents, rather, that, that uh, concern law enforcement uh, in dash cam video, body cam video, uh, and you were going to, uh, your office was going to start to release uh, those uh, tapes uh, a bit quicker uh, than the normal time. Uh, and, and that was a pretty big decision for, for you to make, no? Yes, it was. No, and I think it will go a long way towards restoring public confidence in the fairness of the system, which we absolutely have to have if we're going to get a handle on this crime problem. Um, in the past, <clears throat> you know, in the prior administration, uh, they would wait until the TBI investigation was entirely complete, which right. could maybe be up to a year because you have to wait for lab results to come back and the autopsy to come back and there's a lot of other things. And then even then, they would start the process of redacting hours and hours of video, which itself could take further months. So. You know, it would be a long, long time between the incident and the time that the public got to see the video. We're trying to move things a lot more quickly now. Um, after we get key witness interviews done so that there's no chance that publication of the video can kind of contaminate witness uh, testimony, then we'll go ahead and do it right away. And we'll just provide a redacted version of just the key incident itself, just those few minutes that are the most relevant and we'll get up there on the website as soon as possible. We've already done that uh, with a couple of cases and you'll be seeing more uh, like that in the next few weeks. We are, uh, of course, uh, all preparing for a major election. We are uh, electing uh, the, the election of a new mayor in this city and of course the city council uh, races as well. Uh, many folks have said uh, that this is a very consequential election. We've not seen an open seat like this in about, uh, and I know you've been around here for a while, 20 or 30 years. Uh, but uh, whoever sits in the mayor's seat uh, in January of 2024 is going to have a lot on their plate. And of course, uh, one of the, the probably the top issue is crime. And you're going to be working uh, pretty closely uh, with uh, the mayor's office in, in terms of that uh, how do you feel about about this race and 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 really the importance of, of folks going out and, and voting for, for for a new leader? Well, you are right. It's an extremely important race. Um, it's been many years since we had a wide open field like this. Um, you know, I think there was after Mayor Harrington resigned, there was technically an open seat, but even then, you had an incumbent county mayor running. Uh, to go before that, you'd have to go a few more decades before you really had no obvious incumbent or person waiting in the wings. It was sort of open for many, many different people. You know, we've got like 17 candidates or something like that. Um, it is very momentous. Crime is the big issue. I, of course, personally am very interested in who gets the, uh, the mayoral reins because I'm going to have to be working very closely with them because they are in charge of the police chief. and. Right. You know, the vast majority of cases I prosecute have to do with the Memphis Police Department, which is all the more reason why you're absolutely right. Voting is absolutely essential. If you are registered, you've got to make sure you vote in this election if you're a Memphis uh, voter. Early voting starts on September 15th. Mm -hmm. October 5th is the actual election. One way or another, get out there and let your voice be heard. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things uh, that uh, the new mayor, whomever he or she is, is going to have to deal with is the Department of Justice uh, investigation that is happening now. Uh, they've also had a couple of public meetings 
uh, in terms of that. I've not spoken to you since uh, since uh, this all came down. What is your what is your thought about uh, about uh, their investigation being here, and what do you hope uh, will come out of this uh, as an end result? Well, I welcome the investigation, Chip. You may or may not know this, but I used to work for the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Justice Department in Washington, D.C. I was a civil rights lawyer mm -hmm. for the DOJ. I'm very familiar with this process. In fact, I am familiar with the individuals involved. You know, uh, some of the people that were here in town for the announcement were people that I used to work with. <clears throat> I have a lot of confidence in their ability and in their fairness. I think it's essential. Uh, you know, after Tyree Nichols and all the other incidents that have occurred for years uh, that, you know, never resulted in any uh, accountability, I think it's essential that we have an outside competent force do a stem to stern systemic look to see what are the problems in the uh, Memphis Police Department. Um, I think the vast majority of MPD officers are people of good faith, but you can say that and you can also say at the same time, that there are systemic problems, there are issues of culture and supervision and training that need to be addressed. And only an outside independent entity with the power and the expertise of the DOJ can really do that. Yeah, I think uh, a, a lot of people are, you know, in the city are, are skeptical, but 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 hopeful uh, that this will really yield some things that will, because a pattern of practice and as you said, you you've been. You, this is what you did, uh, you know, b b back in the day. But when they come in to talk about a pattern of practice, it's a pretty serious deal. And I'm not trying to be funny when I say that, but this is a pretty serious deal, is it not? It is. It is. Um, the DOJ is not in the habit of launching one of these investigations every time there is a single high-profile incident. Right. You know, even something as um, high-profile as Tyree Nichols, that alone would not warrant a pattern and practice investigation. That only happens when after a pretty exhaustive review lasting months and interviews and you know looking at media reports and statistics, the DOJ believes there is some reason to suspect that there is a systematic pattern of civil rights violations. And they found that to be the case in at least three areas, excessive force, um, traffic stops, mm -hmm. search and seizure problems, mm -hmm. and uh, and racial profiling in general, um, and you know I like I said before I, I I think it's healthy that they are looking into it and you know these kinds of things can result in court orders and consent decrees that uh, you know will really have some teeth to them. You know, uh, one of the things uh, that uh, has has come up here lately, of course, we know. Uh, the city council uh, created some ordinances uh, talking about some of the issues you just mentioned uh, and, and, and making some changes uh, uh, in how MPD does what they do. Now the county commission is starting to take a closer look uh, at the Shelby County Sheriff's Office. I wanted to get right. your take on that. What's, what's your viewpoint on that? I think it's healthy. I'm glad they're doing it. Um, you know, n I don't think the uh, issues of uh, culture and accountability and the need for reform is limited just to the MPD. I think, you know, law enforcement throughout Shelby County probably could stand uh, some type of uh, reform. And I'm glad that the county commission is looking into it. I think a lot of the things that were done on the city side could also be uh, validly and wisely done on the county side as well. District Attorney Steve Mora, I really enjoy having uh, having conversation with you. You're always one to uh, give a direct and straight and honest answer, and I really appreciate that. And I thank you for taking some time out of your business schedule to join us in our Real Talk audience tonight. And I look forward to talking to you again down the road. Great. Thanks. Take care now. You too now. Take care. District Attorney Steve Mulroy, ladies and gentlemen of Chevy of uh, of, uh, of uh, Chevy County, and of course uh, a lot of, a lot of things on the plate out here, a lot of issues, uh, and uh, he is uh, tackling them a uh, one issue at a time. Thank you very much for coming on the show. We're going to take a, a next uh, commercial break, and when we come back, we're going to shift gears. We're going to, we're going to continue talking about politics. Uh, as we said before, we have a very uh, consequential mayor's race coming up, and we're to talk to a reporter uh, that that part of her beat, so to, so to speak. Uh, this is Real Talk Memphis. I'm Chip. Quick break. Right back.
If you like Real Talk, here's a way you can get involved. Do you have a show topic idea or suggestion? Want to be considered a guest or have a guest idea? Then send Chip a message on his Real Talk show page and you can be a part of the Real Talk experience. So as he always says, go out and tell somebody. We'll be right back. Radio is fun, but we can't give you a high five through the airwaves. That's why we're planning a party to get up close and personal with all of our favorite WYXR faithful. See us at Bar DKDC for a happy hour hangout Wednesday, September 13th at 6 p.m. DJ Rhinestone and David Swider will be your musical hosts. Proceeds from a $10 cover go to making WYXR an even greater resource for music and more in Memphis. More information at WYXR.org. Your vote is your voice. Get Out the Vote Rally is coming soon on Thursday, September 14th at Crosstown Concourse from 5 to 8 p.m. Hosted by the Justice and Safety Alliance, Shelby County Voter Alliance, and partner organizations. The rally will feature live DJs, speakers, ways to give action, and more. More information can be found at bit.ly forward slash GOTV Party 901. Get Real Talk on the TuneIn mobile app under WYXR, and he's now streaming live on Facebook. And you can also catch a rebroadcast on YouTube. Just put WYXR in the search box and hit subscribe. Now back to more Real Talk with Chip Washington. And welcome back to Real Talk Memphis for a Monday evening in the city. And, uh, you know, as we talked about uh, with uh, District Attorney Mulroy, uh, there is a very, very important and consequential election uh, for everybody in the city of Memphis to pay attention to. It's the mayor's race, of course, uh, and uh, the city council is up, is up for grabs as well. And uh, there's a very uh, important mayoral forum that is happening uh, this week uh, on the 14th, which is just a couple, three days away, uh, and sponsored by WMC-TV 5, uh, the, the League of Women Voters, and the Commercial Appeal. So I wanted to have somebody on the show uh, who is a part of that. Catherine Burgess is a, a government reporter for the Commercial Appeal, and Catherine is, always, is also going to be one of the moderators uh, for uh, the forum on Thursday. Catherine, it's great to see you. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show, Chip. Excited to talk about the forum. Yeah, this is, uh, of course, uh, you know, I'm, when I was looking at this in terms of uh, the date, I think this is pretty uh, consequential in and of itself because on the 14th, uh, the next day, the 15th, is when early voting starts. So this gives people a chance uh, to listen to the candidates and, 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 and really, uh, you know, get from the questions that are asked uh, where they stand on things. How important is this to do you uh, and, and to be a part of this? I think this is very important. Obviously, this is such a huge moment for our city. We're going to have a new mayor. It's the first time in a while we haven't had an incumbent running. Um, so it's hugely mom uh, momentous. Um, also, the fact that this is the final forum before early voting starts. We've had a, a couple different forums um, hosted by a bunch of different organizations. Sure. They've all been interesting. They've all had different questions. Um, but this is the last one before early voting. So I think that makes it a little bit stand out. Yeah, you know, absolutely that. And of course, we all know that uh, the top issue, uh, hands hands down, is crime. Uh, so I'm sure there will be a lot of uh, questions pertaining to that. Catherine, as you uh, participate in this as a moderator, what are you looking to hear? What what, what types of uh, questions uh, will be asked, and and what what kind of responses are you are you looking to hear from the candidates? Yeah, so we do have questions on crime. We also have uh, questions on infrastructure, on other topics. Um, we're hoping to cram as much in as we possibly can, both in um, one minute answers, and then also we'll have some lightning rounds. Um, the questions were crafted by a committee of those three organizations you mentioned, um, but based on many questions that came in from the public. Mm -hmm. um, so we really wanted to base our questions around public concerns. And I think that's what I'm hoping to hear as a moderator, but also a Memphian. So I'm hoping to hear these candidates really address the issues that people care about, the issues that address their, that involve their day-to-day -day lives. Now you cover uh, government uh, is is your beat, and you and you cover this, and I've read a lot of stories that, that you have covered uh, in reference to uh, to the campaigns uh, uh, so far. Uh, do you think just just from from your 
your point of view uh, as a newspaper a columnist uh, that uh, the important questions uh, are being addressed by candidates? And do do the, does anybody you know in in your mind uh, have any real answers for some of the real difficult problems that our city is going through? Oh, that's a tough question. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I think that the candidates are all seeking to answer the questions in their own ways, in the way they believe will best address the the issues that our city has. Whether the different answers will actually fix any of our city's problems, um, I think that's harder to answer. Um, there's definitely some, some candidates who have very well fleshed out plans. Um, there's some candidates who are talking mainly focused on one issue. Um, it's it's been very interesting to follow just how they've crafted their positions um, similarly and differently. You know, one of the big problems uh, that we have seen time and time and time again in terms of these elections uh, is the apathy of voters. When we see uh, anywhere from 20 to maybe 30 percent of registered voters in the city of Memphis even bothering to go uh, to the polls. We have 17 candidates running, as you said. There's probably about six, uh, you know, top tier candidates. Uh, but, but, but still, nonetheless, uh, whoever wins this election is going to win by the most votes, um, and probably, in my mind, more of a plurality than a majority. Uh, but, 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 but the apathy that we have seen in this city uh, continually is very troublesome. And I know. Uh, that there has been a great effort to really try to make people understand. Do you think people are starting to really understand just how important it is uh, to go out and vote and how much uh, one vote can make a a big difference in this campaign? I really hope people are starting to understand that, Um, especially members of the media have been stressing the 17 candidates um, on the ballot and just how whoever does win Uh, won't win with the majority of voters and certainly not the majority of Memphians. Um, So I hope people are starting to get it. Uh, With that said, I think people are very tired of politics, um, both nationally and locally. Um, I think actually thinking about your vote mattering and actually getting out and going to vote, taking that time, um, that's a different story. So I don't really, I don't know what the voter turnout is going to be. I, I'm not terribly optimistic, but I, I'm hopeful. <laughs> you know, that's very interesting, and, and, and it's a very honest answer because none of us know. One of the things I do know uh, is that the uh, number or percentage of undecided voters is still pretty high. I mean, it's still about 20, 23, 25, 26%, depending on who you read and, and what you hear. That's still pretty high for for uh, for a, a, an election that's basically right around the corner, uh, and that means I guess it takes a, a lot of folks uh, have yet to make up their minds. I'm just wondering is if this is unusual or is this par for the course? Uh, you know, in, in terms of all of this and people that you're talking with, uh, do folks uh, are, are folks starting to tune in a little bit tighter in terms of this election now? Do you think? Yeah, I think people are realizing that we're in the crunch time. You're gonna ha- if you're gonna vote, you're gonna have to decide who to vote for, and you better decide soon because early voting starts very soon. Mm-hmm. Um, I have been a little surprised by how many people still seem undecided. Yeah, I know I've been getting texts from people saying, you know, tell us about, tell me about the candidates. Um, I know our, our articles have been well read. I was at a fascinating Willie Harrington event the other week that was for undecided millennial aged voters yes. and i was surprised by some of the people who were there very well informed people in this city um and they still hadn't decided who they were going to vote for um so that was a bit of a surprise especially as we're you know coming to the finish line here you know in certain some polls that i have uh, re- seen and read uh many of them have uh former mayor harrington pretty close to the top if not the top uh mm-hmm. and uh, of course uh Paul Young is up there now. He's made quite the move uh, in, in terms of all of this. And then you have Bonner and you have uh, Van Turner and, and even Judge Joe Brown in, in that group. But that, but back to what you were talking about, that Harrington, I read that article and I, I was I was very intrigued by that as well. Uh, do you sense that anyone uh, is focused, uh, any of the candidates, uh, just based from the broad view, uh, uh, have uh, focused uh, much attention, if, if any, on the younger voters. I mean, the 18, 19, 20-year-olds uh, who might be interested in, 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 in being a part of this process? I've seen some of that from Paul Young. He is, of course, younger himself. Yes. Um, so I have seen his campaign very much appeal to young people. He's had a lot of young people involved. 
Um, I would say some of the, the other candidates about average um, and then that Willie Harrington event was a bit of, I would think, maybe an anomaly. That was, you know, the 83-year-old candidate trying to appeal to millennials. Yeah. And that was very much pushed by uh, Shelby County Commissioner Brittany Thornton. Mm -hmm. So it does, I think, depend a little bit on who your supporters are and if they're going to help you engage in that push to um, engage with younger voters. Also, younger people are not our primary voting bloc in Memphis. So right. I do think um, that they they might not be the first group of people on a candidate's mind. Well, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, anytime that there is a healthy debate, and I love reading your your stuff, you you get right to it and, and you're pretty direct and, and you ask the right questions and to get the right answers. But I think any any type of event like this, like you're having in a couple of days here, uh, is, is, is crucially important. And I have no doubt uh, that uh, the questions that will be asked will be uh, direct and focused and to the point because people need all of the information that they can gather uh, through events like this. And, you know, we, we've had conversations through this election so far that uh, several candidates uh, don't show up for forums. They don't show up for debates. They don't show up for the meeting and things like that. Uh, and, and, and so this one here uh, has a lot of meat to it because, again, as you say, the very next day. And, and, and last question for you, um, uh, Catherine, do you think that the early voting numbers uh, once uh, completed will give us a, a clearer picture or a better picture as to what people are thinking in terms of the numbers and how interested folks actually are in this election? Well, I wish I had a better answer for you, but my answer is I really have no idea. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of unknown with this election to the point that I'm preparing for multiple possibilities of who might win. Yeah. Um, and I I don't know. Um, it, it depends on how big the turnout is during early voting, and I just don't know how that's going to be. Yeah, none of us do, and I, I, that, that's really what I'm watching. I'm watching to see what the early early uh, the voting numbers are. Uh, maybe they'll give us a, a window into what, what what is going on. But once again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, big uh, mayoral forum going on. Uh, I believe it's Thursday, right? Uh, it's Thursday. Okay. Yeah, right. Uh, and and again, uh, it's sponsored by the Commercial Appeal. Uh, WMC TV five who will televise the debate uh, and the League of Women Voters and it will be over at the University of Memphis at uh, Rose uh, Hall is that the uh, Rose Theater Rose mm -hmm. Theater right now people can actually go to this right you can actually come and be in person right absolutely we would love to have um, I think it's, there's 900 seats there we'd love to have a full audience on TV as well as in person. Well, listen, Catherine, thank you so much, uh, not only for the work that you do on a daily basis with the Commercial Appeal. Uh, you're going to be one of the moderators, as we said, and we look very much forward to uh, this uh, this gathering on Thursday evening. Uh, best of luck, and we'll continue uh, to keep a close eye on you down the road. Thank you so much. Thank you. Much appreciated. You too. Thank you. Uh, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. A, a, a clear view in terms of someone who deals with this on a daily basis, what Catherine does, uh, and again, uh, as the government reporter, and we're still trying to figure things out. A lot of the, a lot of folks are trying to figure this election out. It's an anomaly, uh, and this is the first time in like 30 years we've actually had an open seat. And trying to get people to understand how critically important it is to go out and exercise your right to vote uh, could not be more clear. So we thank for Catherine for being uh, with us uh, tonight. We're going to take one final break, and when we come back, uh, we're going to shift gears, and we're going to talk a little bit about the local theater scene here in Memphis and Shelby County. This is Real Talk Memphis. I'm Chip. We'll be right back. If you like Real Talk, here's a way you can get involved. Do you have a show topic idea or suggestion? Want to be considered a guest or have a guest idea? Then send Chip a message on his Real Talk show page and you can be a part of the Real Talk experience. So as he always says, go out and tell somebody. We'll be right back. Crosstown Brewing Company is excited to bring you the sixth installment of Crosstoberfest, CBC's annual celebration of beer, autumn, music, food, and fun. The event is on October 14th from 12 to 8, with live music starting at 1. Expect fun for the whole family with activities for the kids, food, games, and more. More information can be found on the brewery's social media channels. 
Did you know you could donate your vehicle and support WYXR at the same time? We offer free pickup and it's tax deductible. Go to cars.wyxr.org to donate your car today. The V&E Green Line Art Walk returns on Saturday, October 7th from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. at Kirby Station on the trail. The event will feature local art, food trucks, beer and wine, kids art activities, and live music. Learn more at vegreenline.org. Church Health's Memphis Plan continues its decades-long commitment to serving local musicians with comprehensive health care and also tailors its focus to small business owners and the self-employed. Healthcare through the Memphis Plan provides care in Memphis for Memphians. Related services include preventative health, optometry, dental care, and more. More information regarding availability at memphisplan.org or at 901-272-PLAN. WYXR is supported by Memphis Presents, celebrating White Sicker's 10th anniversary with a beer and music festival on Saturday, October 21st. BAM Fest will feature music from Memphis and beyond with artists such as Lucero, Hank Sullivan, and Nathan Vanderpool from Blitz and Trapper. Simon Spine and Dead Soldiers will also take the stage. Intermissions will feature sets from DJ Leroy and live performances from the Stone Crush Memphis Modern Soul Compilation. More information is available at MemphisPresents.com. WYXR is community radio, so why not help us spread our sound through the community? Be a part of our growth by sharing our station and our mobile app with a friend. Visit us at WYXR underscore Memphis on social and tag your closest pals. Let someone you love know about 91.7 FM. It's easy. Our sound is made just for you, so let's make it louder. Get Real Talk on the TuneIn mobile app under WYXR, and he's now streaming live on Facebook. And you can also catch a rebroadcast on YouTube. Just put WYXR in the search box and hit subscribe. Now back to more Real Talk with Chip Washington. And welcome back to uh, the show on this beautiful Monday evening. And uh, as we alluded to earlier, Live theater uh, is is, uh, is something uh, that is is really a treat for for many folks here in Memphis uh, and the Mid South, and we have many theaters uh, that provide some top line quality entertainment. So I wanted to uh, bring someone on the show who I've befriended a bit. He is uh, the director of community relations uh, for Playhouse on the Square, and he also does little acting. Uh, C J Thomas <laughs> is his name, and C J, it's great to see you, my friend. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you, Chip? Man, we're doing okay. We're holding on, as 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 they say. So, listen, uh, you haven't uh, been with uh, Playhouse on the Square uh, long, uh, but as your role as the director of community relations, it, it really is to start to uh, develop and, and 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 create and form partnerships uh, and really uh, let folks know just how special Playhouse on the Square is. Am I am, am I right about that? Yeah, absolutely. That's what I do. I'm the person that's out in the community, talking to people, hanging out, building those partnerships and relationships, and just letting people know that Playhouse on the Square is here, and we're here for you guys. So, so you know, you you started a new season, uh, you know, obviously, yeah. and and I, I know one of the things was uh, that that was important was to try to. Uh, let people know from a ticket uh, buying perspective uh, that you that you were aware of that and you were you were focused on that. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. and tell us a little bit about how you all try to adjust that ticket prices. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, like we when we coming back from the pandemic, of course, everyone was hit pretty hard. And um, a lot of theaters were actually raising their prices and making it a little bit more more expensive in order to cover costs. Um, but people weren't buying tickets like they were. So a lot of the theaters were on, I mean, and are on the verge of on, the, on, on like shutting down. Um, and so something we wanted to try and do is like, because we are, I mean, yes, we are your regional professional theater here in Memphis. But we also want, we are a community theater. Like we are all about the community. We want the community to be involved. And that's the only way theater survives is, is, is if we cater to our community. Right. 
Um, so we thought it would be a really good idea to try and instead of raising prices and these theaters are closing down, what if we lowered our prices and we sliced the prices by 50 percent? Um, and we got some backers and we got some people that support us and are on board with that so that we are able to do that so that we get more people in the theater. Just let people know that we're here. Come see a professional show. Come have a good time. Find your place at Playhouse and 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 like just experience what theater has to offer. You know, you said you're a professional theater, a regional theater, you know, here. And, of course, uh, uh, it, it, people don't really understand the process of of what it takes to try to get a particular show that has been on Broadway in New York City and, uh, you know, here. And, and there's a lot that goes into all of that uh, in, in, in particular. So I am... Um, uh, I am uh, curious about uh, a particular program that you have coming on. You have a new uh, play that is going to open on Friday night. It's called yes. It's called Fat Ham, and and Fat it, Ham. It, and it is uh, the uh, Hamlet through the eyes yep. of the of the black community of the of the African American exactly. community. This sounds yeah. pretty interesting. And from what I read, CJ, tell me if I'm correct. Is this the first uh, this play in particular? Uh, this is the first city outside of New York uh, that it is going to be uh, performed in? Yeah, absolutely. So the uh, it just closed down on Broadway, I want to say in August. It was this summer. It just closed down, and we already had the rights to it. Um, our executive producer, Mike Detroit, is fantastic. He has a lot of connections. And so we are going to be one of the first professional theaters in the nation that get to reproduce this fantastic play. How big a deal is this? I mean, in terms of um, the, the concept of it sounds interesting, uh, you know, in and of itself, uh, a, a, a performance of Hamlet uh, from a very classical play, as we all know, uh, you know, from the black yeah. from the black perspective. How, how, do, you, how, how do you break that down? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's really cool. So it's influenced by Hamlet. So it's not the thieves and the thous or anything like that. <laughs> right. But it was like it's, it is an interpretation of the Hamlet so story. So everything that Hamlet went through. Um, our character is named Juicy. He goes through, um, and it's all about finding identity within the family. Um, it all it takes place at a cookout, um, and and just like Hamlet's uh, father dies and his mother marries his uncle, it's the same kind of deal. Mm -hmm. And then putting it more in our language and and making our cultural more aware. Um, yeah, and it's 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 a really funny. It's really funny how they interpret it. Um, it's, it's, you're going to laugh, you're going to cry. My, our goal is to really engage our audience. And, and I want you to walk out of there feeling like, I want, I mean, like for me as a black man, I want to be empowered, you know, and this show empowers us. It gives us power. And it says like, I mean, we may not be able to see our through story or through all these different, you know, classic literature and things, mm -hmm. but being able to find who we are in that stuff is really, really important. So it's, it's a really, really big deal. We're really excited about it. And I, I can't wait for everybody to come see it. I think I'm gonna have to come see that myself just to <laughs> yeah, just to lay just to lay witness to all of this. Uh, some, <laughs> some 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 of the uh, uh, some of the uh, stage plays that you have uh, uh, this uh, this season. Kind of run down a few of them uh, for what audiences can expect. Yeah, we got. I mean, like we just started our season 55. We're about. Two, we're only two shows in, so we have 14 productions um, on three stages and then one touring production. So 15 total. We have a touring production that will go to different various schools and we'll send out up to a 250-mile radius. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, which is really, really cool. So our next big one is our holiday show. It's The Wizard of Oz. Everyone's super excited about that. That's a biggie. Um, they start rehearsals here within a couple of weeks. Yeah, that's a biggie, isn't it? That's a big. That's a biggie. Yeah, it's a big one. That's yeah. a big one. And then we also have Charlie and the Chocolate Chocolate Factory, which I am super, super excited about because we're doing it. We're not going to cast it as traditionally it's cast. So, like, we're open to gender. We're open to race. I mean, Charlie could be a girl, you know, okay. for all we care. We're going to tell this story in a beautiful way where people can relate to it. And I'm really, really stoked about that. Um, we have Arms Too Short. Um, to box with God yes. for all of our churchgoers. Yes, that's a big one. Yes, that is. That is. I, I've, <laughs> I've seen that. I've seen that in in another iteration back in Los Angeles. I mean, that it's been around for yeah. a very long time. An excellent, excellent play. Uh, you know, it, it it does seem as if uh, you're reaching out 
uh, uh, to expand your horizon audience wise Absolutely. and bring more people in, in, involved in this. Uh, you and I uh, have talked uh, offline about it really is a, a rather difficult process uh, because you have so many people bidding for plays off Broadway and, yeah. and having to yeah. decide exactly what type of shows you want to have here that you think people yeah. will be in, in, in engaged in. Uh, it, it really is a bit of a process, isn't it? Not? It's definitely it's definitely a bit of a process. It's something that, that theaters should really think about. It's not about just getting the big names out there, the Wicked's out there, or the Frozen, the musical, which is doing fantastic right now. Yeah. It's not about that. It's like knowing your community and knowing who you are. And when we're in a city where it's mostly African-American, why aren't we choosing those big names and those plays that are willing these Tonys and full of surprises in order to engage our audience here in Memphis? So, yeah, it's, it's something we are taken very seriously. Um, and definitely with season 55, before I even got here, season 55 was planned out. And you already know season 56 is gonna be off the hook because yeah. we are really diving in and sinking our teeth in to this idea of how to engage our community. And what are some things that our community wants to see versus, you know, just dishing out big names. Yeah, absolutely that. Well, CJ Thomas, uh, Director of Community Relations for Playhouse on the Square. He's also an actor. Uh, CJ, yeah. thanks for thanks for taking the time to come on the show. It sounds like you're going to have some really good stuff, and I'm sure I'll be in attendance uh, for more than one of them this season. Yes, you better. Yes, uh, you better. CJ, thank you so much, man. Best of luck uh, as, as you move uh, down the road into season 55, and we look forward to bringing you back down the road, okay? That sounds great, Chip. Thank you so much. You too, man. Thank you. Have a great night. All right. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Yes, sir. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, that puts a wrap on uh, this edition of uh, Real Talk Memphis as Brent plays us out. Listen, uh, it's been another good show. And I thank all my guests for coming on tonight and uh, chatting with us and giving us some good information, of course. Uh, I want to also thank you, uh, the listening audience out there. Uh, if you like what you see, if you like what you hear, if you have any thoughts or suggestions about how we can do things better, I'm always open to that as well. Uh, really appreciate you. Look, we have to continue to keep doing what we're doing. If we don't continue to do what we do, we will never grow. And we want to grow and we want to be impactful and we want to make a difference in this community. Thank the folks on Facebook. I think there might have been an issue with uh, the technical aspect of things tonight on, on, on Facebook. But nonetheless, uh, you know, you can always check out the re repeat like many of you do as soon as uh, they post the show right after the show is over. So go on my page and check it out. Uh, as well. We really appreciate you. So for Bryn, Nicole, and Lola, I'm Chip. You have a great week. You be safe. And we are out. <laughs>